Welcome to Energy Talks, a regular podcast series with expert discussions on power system testing, data management, cybersecurity, and important trends in the power industry. Hello, everyone. It is always great to speak with guests worldwide to get their perspectives on various power industry topics, such as what they face on the job and how they deal with continuous changes in the power system. In this episode, we speak with Omicron sales and application engineer, Yera Poliervi, who is based in Finland. Yera has several years of experience in building new and modernizing older substations. He worked with various substation equipment as a commissioning engineer for electrical contractors in Finland before joining Omicron. Yara will share his experiences in dealing with challenges presented by continuously evolving power grids and substation equipment in his region. As in previous episodes of Energy Talks related to this topic, Yara highlights the importance of continuous training, open communication, and documentation to help substation engineers deal with constant change. Yara also introduces the critical aspect of red pen documentation, emphasizing the importance of active communication and feedback exchange between customers, substation contractors, and asset manufacturers to reflect actual field experience. So without further delay, welcome Yara to this episode of Energy Talks. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. Yara, first of all, could you tell me where exactly are you located in Finland? I'm located in Kajaani, Finland. If you look at a map of Finland, it's on the middle of Finland. How far away is that from Helsinki? Uh, it's around... 600 kilometers by car. So, Yera, please describe your experience in power system testing and your other work at substations in Finland up until now. Yeah, of course. Before I moved to Omicron, I was a commissioning engineer at two different contractors in Finland. And at those contractors, I was mainly involved in building new or overhauling old substations. I was the protection tester mainly secondary testing, protection testing, including ground fault protection over current distance protection and also differential protection. I use, also used to do IEC 61FD and 104 communication protocols between substations on RTUs. And I've used Omicron products such as the CMC, the CPC and Sibano as my daily drivers at those companies, and I've also done some primary testing with CMC, CPC 100. Okay, so you also have some experience in the primary testing area. Yes, I do. And the last more interesting protection application I became familiar with was the ABB's new touch voltage-based ground fault protection scheme, uh, which was actually innovated and developed in Finland. My previous contractor company was the first to use it in the real world as the actual protection function. And we were the pioneers of that function for the distribution operator here in Finland. I've also worked with production plants and wind farms. I have first-hand experience at protesting protection schemes at wind farms, even from the top of the turbine. I worked with the bigger TSOs in Finland. And I've also created the groundwork for communication for the DSOs to operate the grid. What do you consider to be the most satisfying aspect of your work up until now? The best part of my work was, of course, the successful energization of a substation. But beneath that, there was also the satisfaction that your own work and seeing the effort that you put in doing research, dealing with customers, solving problems and putting yourself out of the comfort zone actually benefited the end user. And I've always played with the idea that going onwards, someone, somewhere the end user, the consumer, would realize one day that they haven't had as many outages as they had before and have been wondering what has been done differently. Because the industry is visible thanks to the news, but the work we do is invisible. Because only when the lights go out, people actually start to care why the lights went out. And that's the unfortunate environment most of us work in. So what then made you join Omicron as a sales application engineer? Well, I've always believed in the power of knowledge. 
And I've been through a lot of uncertainty at the beginning of my career that I sort of promised myself if I ever find myself in a position of professionalism where someone else could benefit from the knowledge I possess, that I'm willing to share that in any way possible. Because my career was beset by all sides, by lack of information, guidance and confidence that I don't want that to happen to anyone if I can help it. And that was also the time I decided that the industry standard of enough is not enough. And at Omicron, we strive to change the industry standard and show that there are better ways of doing things. And we also try to package that in a way that it's effortless to adopt it. It's a unique combination of technical expertise and usability in Omicron products that first amazed me and now inspires me to be a part of the push to a better future. Very good. So tell me, what are your responsibilities and focus areas working now at Omicron in Finland? So my main focus in Finland is the sale of Omicron products from the whole product portfolio. So the IC61, A50 and the primary and secondary products. I also serve as a contact point for new customers. And I'm also an application engineer, so I support customers in Finland with their questions and problems. I am also responsible for trainings, customer meetings, and generally representing Omicron in Finland. So based on your experience, Yera, how would you characterize the power system in Finland? Are there any critical areas of focus? Generally speaking, I would like to say that the power system in Finland is rather well done. We do generally things very well here because, well, of course, there are regional differences, but always the solutions that we use are well tested and proven to function as intended. In very rare cases, you can even find a part of a power system that is left to its own devices. And I think that is thanks to the Finnish regulation, which is constantly updated and monitored and enforced. Sounds like the perfect world, but are there any challenges that testing engineers face with the changing power grid in Finland, for example? And what are some of the time-consuming and stressful areas presented to um, engineers in the field? Well, most of the time for the engineers, it's the uncertainty of what you are up against. Uh, that eases a bit over time and with experience, but it never fully goes away because when a customer requests work from a commissioning engineer, they expect full competence with every single aspect of the work. And it's usually that expectation you have to sometimes break and say that this is something new I haven't seen before and this is something new I have to look into before I can perform any work for you. And you never know what that new thing is because very rarely you get any information beforehand. And there's also the mastery of different solutions used by different customers. You need to master the whole system before you can do any deeper diagnosis of any problems that lie within. or And that's usually something you just don't have time for. And very easily commissioning engineers are profiled in companies to cater to specific customers because they already know what the customer requires and what the customer needs. And that creates inflexibility. For example, when I arrived at a site, I usually had to learn new protection schemes that I had never learned about. And it's very time consuming to start searching for information when you're at a site and when time is critical and it doesn't lead to great results and leaves the end results somewhat vague. Interesting. Okay, so going back to an area that you've been involved with before, Yera, how much effort and coordination does it take to upgrade older substations compared with building new ones? Oh, well, a Greenfield project, which is a new substation, is not constrained by prior work. The analogy to that is of a construction to a greenfield land where there is no existing buildings or infrastructure present. But a modernization projects measure the designer's expertise and knowledge of different systems and their applications. It also benchmarks the engineer's ability to adapt to different solutions and involves more creative thinking. Usually the modernization projects take a lot more effort if the designer has not familiarized themselves with the project on hand or they must start designing 
new plans using older, inconsistent documentation as a reference. And the documents are the decisive factor in a modernization project compared to a new project, because if the documentation is incorrect even by a few details, it's usually useless. Because everything affects everything, and when you change one small part of it, you have to trace the line forwards and change everything that comes after that. And, well, at some point, if you get to the point that the documentation is severely incorrect, it's cheaper and easier to just stop what you are doing and revise the whole documentation again before you continue. And that's another issue with the modernized newer project, because you're free to build basically what you want, and then you can correct it afterwards in the documentation. Okay, that's a good point. Let's get into that just a little later. How can the outcomes of modernization projects affect or even complicate the work of testing engineers? Modernization is a dance between simplicity and chaos. If you have great project management and good designs and an experienced engineer, you usually achieve a result that is easy to maintain and is serviceable and is safe to use. But on the other hand, if the plans start to deteriorate at an early phase, the documentation is corrected at site or not at all. It's a nightmare for anyone afterwards to do any sort of maintenance or operations with that piece of equipment. And that ties to the point of you never know what you're up against, because when you arrive to a customer site, you could have a nice and simple job turned into days of extra work just because you cannot trust anything that is shown on the documentation. Interesting point. Yara, what role do documentation and training play in helping engineers keep up to date and master the challenges of ever increasing changes? And most importantly, keep everyone on the same page with the latest practices. Training and documentation is the most important thing in this industry because you can get only so much knowledge just by working on the field and getting experience from that way. The problem is that where do you find the time as an engineer to actually read and familiarize yourself with all the new material that is coming out? And what are the channels where you can find this documentation in the first place? It's too reliant on manufacturer-issued documents or technical papers made by individuals who are not easily found online or in clear catalogs. Okay, so if they're so difficult to find, how would testing engineers find them in the end? Do they have to speak with contractors or people involved with the substation modernization? This is a question we at Omicron must also consider because I thought about this and I didn't find a direct answer to this anywhere. It could originate from the manufacturer itself who makes the product. They could give you the documentation or the knowledge, or it could be the distributor of that particular product, or it could be word of mouth. It could be from exhibitions. But the problem is how do we collect and share this information with people that is you know, widely accessible? That is the greatest issue we have currently because the information is so spread out. What is your first-hand experience with this? Obviously, you've done some searches and you haven't been successful in finding the information together in one place. How have you been able to keep up to date? Well, the companies I worked at were active at organizing internal trainings. So either with our own resources by sharing knowledge within or inviting outside experts from, let's say, manufacturers or other contracting companies if available. But the amount of training to actually stay on top of the current situation is significantly more than any company can reasonably arrange. So the alternative is usually by word of mouth or internal forums or similar platforms. Does increasing digitalization help speed up the process at all? It does help. Digitalization creates new avenues for people to share information. So you have online portals and you have every single imaginable way of communicating. But the unfortunate effect of that is that it creates probably too much or at least unaccounted information, which you as a reader have to filter out, which is actually useful and which is not. Okay. So this brings up a topic that you wrote to me about that really fascinated me. 
Jared, could you describe the importance of red pen documentation from customers and how it, it can improve the situation? What have been your experiences with this? Let's put it this way. No matter how good of a designer you have at your disposal, there's inevitably going to be some changes or corrections to existing plans. And it's the responsibility of every engineer to document those changes clearly. And that is usually achieved with a simple red pen marking on the design to distinguish the corrected design. And the red pen's corrections are a flexible way to correct smaller mistakes on the go and it doesn't involve the designer at every single time a mistake is found. Okay, so how do you ensure that this type of correction gets to the right people? So it's key to define the responsibilities for who is responsible for collecting all the corrected plans and who will send them to be finalized. Uh, it can be the site manager, it can be the project manager, usually it's the commissioning engineer, but it also can be an ex external person to the project, for example, from the design team who collects and sends all the red pen documentation to the designer to be finalized. Very good. You talked about designs affecting substations and substation equipment and bringing in new technology and making sure that that's well documented. Now, what about testing equipment manufacturers? How well do they keep up with evolving assets and changing grids? We've been talking now from the standpoint of the substation engineers working with uh, contractors and asset manufacturers. But in testing this equipment, do you feel that testing equipment manufacturers keep up with changes? That's a good question. I won't say names, but there are a few companies who actually actively try to keep up with the changing environment, the changing equipment, and they are mostly doing it well, but the products in itself are a bit limiting because there's no reason to launch a new product which has the new feature every single year because it's too costly but you have to maybe adapt the older equipment to work with the new technologies and you have to create your own equipment to you know outlast the technology evolving which is a tough challenge to make because you don't know what's going to happen in 10 years or even 15 years or even in five years. But I think where we are going now, we can probably predict that the future is going to be, you know, more digital. So maybe as a company, we should invest in that for anyone else. Yeah. And we've done many episodes on Energy Talks about how Omicron is staying on top of that and helping to work with digital substations and their continual uh, development and changes. So given all that we've talked about here, what should our listeners remember most from our discussion about continued substation change and the challenges that brings? And do you have any tips for testing engineers to master them? And what would I like for listeners to take out from this is that in the changing environment of power grids, the importance of planning, coordination and individual responsibility is taken to a higher level because no longer can you just focus on doing only your own part at a job site, but you must be at least aware of what other people are doing, what their responsibilities are and actively communicate with the whole site organization in order to make your work go smoothly. And you also have to be proactive in searching information, asking questions and not taking everything at face value. For engineers, I would say be vigilant. Don't afraid to question what you see and do your research because your value is at how much you know and what you can achieve and not how quickly you can get things done. Networking is probably one of the most powerful tools you can have as an engineer. So do not be afraid to share information because when you share information, people are going to share information with you also. So 
I strongly suggest you to make connections, meet people and talk up openly about your issues. And maybe somebody has solved them already and you can learn by somebody else's mistakes. Very good. Well, thank you, Jera, for joining me in this episode of Energy Talks. Thank you for having me. It's been great to speak with you. And a big thank you to our audience for listening to this and other episodes of Energy Talks. We always welcome your questions and feedback. Please send us an email to podcast at omicronenergy.com. Omicron has several years of experience in power system testing, data management, and cybersecurity, and offers a matching solution for your application. For more information, visit our website at omicronenergy.com. Please join us for the next episode of Energy Talks. Goodbye for now, everyone. Mm-hmm.